Welcome, everybody. This is the rescheduled Tuesday, or no, yeah, tonight is Tuesday, and we normally do webinars every week on Thursday nights, but I have a conflict, so we bumped it to Tuesday. But uh, either way, welcome. Tonight's topic is bring all your tough questions. And uh, before we can look at any charts or trade setups, we have to do our standard disclaimer. All communications from trading systems are for educational purposes only. Futures trading does involve risk, and there is a risk loss. Nothing contained in this webinar or other webinars, including the live trading room, are to be construed as investment or trading advice. And, of course, everybody in here does know that you do trade at your own sole discretion. Okay. All right, so um, let's do this. This is an open mic night, so to speak, where we're going to take questions from the uh, from all of you trader participants. And so I'm going to take the first few minutes and just go ahead, formulate your questions. I will write them all down, and I will do my best to get to all of them. All right, let's see here. Brian K. has asked, one, two, three, reversal box, when and why don't. So one, two, three, reversal. Okay. Let's see who else we got. Uh, David H. Midband trade. David H. Midband, yes or no? Okay. Uh, Kumaresh. YM4 range at 905 Central for midband box trade. Where do you put the stop loss and would you reverse? That's pretty. <laughs> Okay, I don't think we'll try to try to get that one in there. So that's uh, uh, YM uh, 705 midband. Okay, all right. Uh, James B. Uh, are the trades called clearly in the room? Or entry targets and stop newbie trader. I have a hard time using object trader box trade when. Uh, wait a minute. Are the uh, Yes, the trades are called in the room, uh, James. Um, in fact, Gary, normally, if it's if time permits, he will put, uh, we use um, a, a semi-automated strategy called Object Trader, and most of the way we use that is by engulfing the candles with a mid-band box. In fact, let me show you that right here. I had a two-part series that explains that, and I believe it is posted on the web for everybody to see. Stand by. I will show you that. It's loading. Hold on. Uh, uh, right here. Master mid-band trades. On the web, go to our little tool widget. Go to the webinar link page right here. First one. I think this is Saturday. I think that's Saturday or Thursday. I thought that was a two-part series. Well, maybe we don't have both up. I, I know that's at least part one. Um, and we have a second one in there. Quickly see and support. Oh, here. This might have been the two-part series. Quickly see the trend and potential trades, one and two. If you want to learn anything about mid-band trades, watch those three webinars. I go into extreme detail, bar by bar, on how to take to spot and take mid-band trades. This webinar, this webinar, and this one. Those are great vids, Lisa. Yes, they were the two-part series. Those three. This one. Load up this page. And by the way, for those of you who are already subscribers, if you go into the member area, these three are in there too. And most of you, I think, have probably already seen it. So it's this one. On the 13th, this one, the two-part series, part two on the 10th, and this one, part one on the 6th. If you want to know anything excruciating detail about mid-band trades, those three will give it to you. Uh, let's see here. Um, uh, 
Adam P, newbie trader, I have a hard time using the OB box when it's active and it's not. How about using sniper line instead? You can use the sniper line instead, Adam, perfectly fine. You can use limit orders. You can use limit orders. So wherever you would, in fact, I'll show that. Okay, let me show that. So limit orders instead of box. Okay. Um, let me see, Davin. How do you deal with the perfect box trade breakout only to have it go a few ticks in favor and then reverse? Getting out of loser quickly. We really needed that today, didn't we? Especially on ES. I'll show you some tips and tricks on how to deal with that. You're going to like these a lot. Can you explain how you use volume up down? You know, Randy, I have that on the chart. I put that on just a second ago. I will look at volume together, okay? Uh, so volume. Okay, make sure you get your questions in because I'm going to start here in just a couple of minutes and then we're going to rock and roll and I'm going to keep going, okay? Any other th ones that I did not get? Um, I think that's it. All right, good. That's a good full plate of questions to uh, to get through. All right, so um, let me uh, start off with this. On, uh, I have an ES chart on, on uh, screen one. Let's get over there and take a look at it real quick. Stand by. All right, you should see an ES chart for range with our indicators, Viper indicators. My cursor moving back and forth. Does everybody see the chart? Viper indicator, chart moving back and forth. ES chart. Yes, everybody see it? Chart moving back and forth. Yes? Okay, cool, good. All right. Okay, first let me, uh, if you're here on an open house, welcome. Um, we do have an open house all week, uh, and I see there's many new faces in here. So um, the one thing I can say is that uh, don't feel – you might feel a little intimidated in everything you're looking at. Some of it might not make a lot of sense to you. Some of you might be new to futures. But let me explain what's going on here. We are futures traders, and we trade intraday volatility of futures markets. So in the live room, for instance, we have crude oil futures. CL, $10 a tick, just got rolled to this February contract, this is the front month now. The E-mini S&P futures, $12.50 a tick, we just rolled to March today. Um, that's also in the live trading room, you've probably seen it if you've been in there. Gold futures uh, are on the uh, February contract, $10 a tick, Those that's also traded in the live room. Uh, we don't trade NASDAQ in the room, but we watch it because sometimes it leads the market up and down. Uh, Russell futures, it's also an equity. It's $5 per tick of movement, also rolled to the March contract. And then, um, we, in fact, we used to have the Russell, and we just changed it to the mini Dow, which is YM, uh, also $5 a tick. We'll try to look at all of these today, tonight, okay? All right. And so we're connected to a data feed to our broker, and we are getting um, four range bars. So each bar is four ticks. It's not tied to time. This is not uh, minute bars or any type of combination of time-based bars. This is just a four range chart. Uh, the indicators that we have running against the data feed is um, the background colors, green, transitional, and red. Generally speaking, when a market's heading up, the background will be green. The bars will predominantly be blue, and in an uptrend, the, the mid band and all the bands will stair step up like such. So this is a good example of an uptrend. Here, here, and here, and here. Okay, that's an uptrend. We'll explain how to trade that in a second. Conversely, when you're in a downtrend, let me see if I can find a downtrend. ES has been going up for so long. ES goes sideways too. So here's a good example uh, example of a range bound sideways market right here. See it? That happens a lot, particularly if you're trading ES. Let's see if I can find a downtrend. I cannot find a downtrend. Oh, here we go. All right, let me clean this chart off. I got some old comments on here from a couple of webinars ago. Drawing tools removed everything. There we go. So a downtrend is the opposite of an uptrend, where you're getting the series of lower highs and lower lows, as shown by this area right here. And uh, that is where uh, the background is uh, red, a solid red, 
bars are predominantly red. They can, however, have a little bit of blue and, uh, and some yellow tucked in there as well on retracements. And so in downtrends, we are shorting retracements. So we have this notion of a thrust, a retracement, what we call a kiss and roll or a rollover up near a resistance level, and then back down we go. And so this is actually the trade entry here on the retracement itself, okay? All right, and so if we're getting long in uptrends, we look for pullbacks or retracements into support to get long. So for instance, here's a thrust up, background turns green, bars are predominantly blue, we're looking to get long, and we pull back into the mid-band area here to get long, okay? Now, um, let's talk about this notion of mid-band trades, okay? And that's a, that's a trade type we strongly urge you to start off with because it's one of the quickest and simplest ones to learn. It's the most straightforward, and in trends, it's very uh, has a very high likelihood of being profitable. It's a good go-to trade. So it's defined in an uptrend as a retracement into when the bars come into this area right here, the band above the mid-band or directly below the mid-band or on the mid-band itself. That is called a mid-band trade right here, like that. In a downtrend, it's the opposite. In terms of location, it is in the same spot in terms of the band above and below. However, or on the mid-band itself, which is the same uh, criteria, definition, if you will. But the difference is, of course, that you're selling resistance and getting short in the downtrend, right? And in the case of the uptrend, you are buying and getting long on the bounce, like such, right? Okay. Now, somebody had talked about mid-band trades, yes or no. I think that was David H. Let's zip towards today, and I want to sh share with you a couple of tips on how you can spot a range-bound market ahead of time. David, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to rip through a few things real quick. If you could uh, just uh, you know, ask everybody in the room. I'm not singling you out, but uh, um, try, let me try to get through about 15 minutes of material here, some things I wanted to cover, and I'll try to answer all these six questions, and then we'll cir circle back and take some fresh ones, okay? Okay, cool. Now, let me show you uh, something that I think you're going to find extremely helpful every morning that you get ready to start trading. Uh, Kumaresh, I don't know what is, how's my volume, everybody? Kumaresh says I'm very light. Is everybody, am I, am I coming through okay? Volume wise, everybody? Anybody else think I'm light? I don't think I, I guess I could boost my mic. I don't know how I do that. Fine here. Good. Volume is good. Good, good. Hey, Kumaresh, you know what you might want to try to do? Um, why don't you try logging out and coming back in and see if that fixes it? Everybody else is saying uh, the volume is is uh, is pretty good, loud and clear. So, yeah, just just go ahead and log out, come right back in, and see if that cleans that up for you. Okay. All right. Now, so one of the things I think I shared with with you, with m most of you, or some of you might know that I do this. Let's go back to the pre market condition, and look at ES um, this morning. And I want to talk about this for the past couple of days. And you can use this on any instrument. And in fact, I'll do it on a couple of them. Okay? All right. 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 Now I want to. I want to con. I want. I want to. Let me back up and explain what's going on. I have a pre-market routine that I do every single morning, and I've been doing it for a long time, and it helps me a lot to visualize how the market may unfold for the morning. And it is as follows. I turn on Bloomberg, and you can use any channel for this. Okay, you can use CNBC. I think you can, get, uh, you can go to the CME Group website, which is free. You can go to, uh, I think, Yahoo uh, uh, Finance will have free uh, quotes on some, some uh, futures markets. Maybe it'll be delayed by you know, a minute or two, whatever. And what I do is I write down the Dow futures, S&P futures, and NASDAQ futures on a top of a piece of paper every morning. And I do that at like 6 o'clock in the morning, about half an hour before the market opens. Okay. Now, when you look at the volatility... 
and I'm just going to do it in this way. Here's, here's the way I'm going to kind of explain this. If you look at the volatility, here is today's volatility in the pre-market. Okay. And here is yesterday's volatility. Over here in the pre-market would have been like from here over to here. Like that. See, 630 is like right over here. What do you notice, what jumps out at you as the difference between a day like yesterday and a day like today in the pre-market? What's the first thing that you notice when you look at this chart? So here was this morning, and here was yesterday, right here. There's a couple of things that should kind of jump right off the page in looking at the stark differences between these two uh, mornings. Huge difference in volume, right? Somebody is mentioning uh, this right here, the size of the volume here in this day here versus the size of the volume over here. Yes. And volume normally equates to what? Can you? Oh, it's paused. Stand by. How did that get paused? Hold on. Stand by. You're not seeing my. You're not seeing my arrows. Okay. You see the arrows now. There we go. So I was talking about the difference between here today and over here. This was yesterday. So here is yesterday morning, and here is this morning in the pre-market session. Okay, so when I got up this morning and I looked at the Dow futures, the Dow futures were up like two points. The S&P futures were up one, and NASDAQ was almost flat. I think it was oscillating between up one or two and down one or two. And so look at the size of the volume of the volatility on the morning session here. Now, and, and is in addition to the size of the volatility, look at, at the look at uh, how is it trending or not trending here versus here. Let me let me show you the open yesterday. The open yesterday would have been right about here. So was it trending? Was the market trending yesterday going into the open? And how about the market here? Here's six thirty coming up right here. Is this market trending over here? No, it's sideways, right? Now, look, you could make the argument that it was sideways to up, and I would agree with that. It was sideways to up, but nonetheless, it was sideways. Here, you can clearly see that coming into the pre-market session, the trend was up. Now, I go back and I look at my notes from yesterday, and yesterday the Dow futures were up 25, S&P futures were up 5.5, and, and NASDAQ futures were up 12. And that would have been right in here when I started looking at it. So what is that portending in terms of size of volatility and the market direction? Number one. Let's talk about pre-market analysis, and that's what we're talking about here And in preparing to take morning trades. So yesterday what we're saying is that the trend was up. Going into the trend was up. And I'm just going to put all the futures prices collectively, okay, Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ. So if you have Bloomberg and if you have CNBC, they're flashing at the bottom of the screen, right? They're flashing, and I'd write those down. And so, so um, volatility yesterday was high. Volatility, just so you know, not volume. Let me, let me be clear about that. The volatility was high. So when we do that, 
And we open, and, and this is important to know, this is extremely important. These are, there's several things that I want you to, you to take away from this because you can use that. You can use that. Uh, oh, I'm on the December contract. Dang, Nabbit, I have these old charts. I don't, I'm not trading off of this one. This is an old training chart. But let me just stick with this, Bill. Good catch. Good catch. This is an old chart that I keep tucked away for training. i got to switch this over, and I'll do that. But I'm too far along in teaching this. So it, the concept and the principle is all the same. Uh, for the other ones, I'll switch to the. I'll switch ahead, okay? Good catch, Bill. Thanks. Right here, you can see that on the current day open high low indicator, which is the blue dashed line is the highs of the day. The black dashed line is the open of the day. And the white line dashed line is the low of the day. So that right here at the open, literally, you opened at the high of the morning. Now, the natural tendency is to want to buy that. right you want to buy that but you can't you have to wait for a pullback which we got right here and this was actually the trade entry right here we called this out and we took it that's a minimum criteria entry on es right there see it where you come below the stealth line in line two so we got to get in on a retracement it didn't get to the mid band but it got to here and we had a beautiful long trade here like that beautiful right out of the gate it's perfect now let's contrast that with here. Now, now today I think I told you Dow futures were up, up like one or two, S and P was like flat, and Nasdaq was nothing, and we could see that the volatility was tight. So let's talk about the pre-market analysis over here. Market range bound volatility low. So when we come into the open, what is our expectation in terms of trade taking here? We'll be lucky to get some scalps on a day like this, right? We're thinking scalp trading. We're thinking that there is a strong likelihood that most of the morning or perhaps the entire day could be confined within these lines right here. And that even the distance between the mid band at 92.50 and up here is only about 15 ticks. So we're thinking scalps. And if it stays sideways to up, we'll be just looking to buy maybe somewhere around the mid band on a, on a dip down and a hold to get long. And if we can get back to the high, we'll be happy with that. Is everybody following what I'm saying? Let's look. Let's go back another day. And then I'll show what happened this morning. Let's see, today's Tuesday, so this would have been Sunday. Let's not look at Sunday because there was a huge gap up. Let's look at this. To get, let's look back at Friday. Friday would have been over here. Same thing on Friday, the 11th. How about this day? Range bound and choppy, tight range. I'd have to go back and look at my notes on this. Same here. Range bound and choppy, staying within the confines of the of the upper bound and limit. Here's an example where we started to go up and then it reversed. So let's go ahead and zip towards today. And then I'll get off this December contract and I want to get YM and a couple other charts up. So this was the end of the story. Uh, came down here, we had a little dip. I can't remember. I know we took a couple of long trades. I believe we took this one. Please, if you remember different, correct me. I believe we caught this retrace. We caught this pop up. I think most people got that. We were happy to see it get up here. What was frustrating in here was that, you know, it sat down here for so long. Oh, my goodness. I think I was ready to go to sleep. Just to put things in perspective, it sat here. It entered this area from here. At 6.46, and it didn't break up over here until 7 o'clock. It spent 15 minutes sitting here, just grinding sideways. Well, there's two things there, Lisa, what we're talking about. There's volatility and there's trend. Volatility it speaks to the size of the range or how, how whether a market is uh, 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 moving or not. And so when you, there's a lot of times you'll get up and you'll look at the Dow futures and they'll be up like 59 points. 
I've seen, I've woken up and I've seen the Dow futures up like 118 points. So that's tell when you see Dow futures up triple digits, that is telling you you're probably going to have a monster day. There was probably some trade news that came out, and it's going to be a monster day. It's probably going to be up, but it could reverse. So you got to be prepared for both days. You get up and the Dow futures are up one or two or less than 10. You don't even have double digits. It's going to be a low volatility day. You're looking for scalps. Now, there was a question here. Let me go back about not using the box. What you can do here, let me make, uh, make sure I'm in SIM. Yeah, SIM. Okay. All right. So where you would normally place a region box would be right here like this. Now, if you don't want to use a region box, you can simply put a buy order to get filled at the top of where it would have broken up here, like such. Okay, like that. Now, where your initial stop would go, now you have the, the, the if you put a region box with object trader, it would automatically place the, um, the, um, uh, targets and the stops and it would trail and so automation would take over from there. You just set it and forget it. In the case of here, you'd have to come, let's say 12 ticks below your entry. 12 is 3, 90, oh, 70. So your, your stop, your initial stop, if you went 12 ticks, would be way down here. 90 and three quarter. Yeah. Way down here. If you put a 12 tick stop on it. Now, if you, if even if OT put a stop down here, should you leave it here? Pop quiz, five seconds. Let me be clear. We're getting long from the break up here out of this region box at the mid band. We're getting long, whether you used OT or limit order. Should you put your stop 12 ticks down here or should it be somewhere else? We're talking initial stop on the entry of the trade. Should it be that far away from your entry, your initial stop, even if OT put it here? What do you think? No? Okay. What are you saying? It should be just under the box? Good. Now, you don't want to put it right here, okay, because you could turn out to get a good trade and you get wicked out of a little candle. You want to take the swing level and go down by at least two or three ticks to right here. Okay, in case you get a little wick, wicking on down here, you don't get bipped out and then the thing runs 20 ticks for you. Yeah, just go like two or three ticks under here. Don't leave it all the way down 12 or 14 ticks down here. Please don't do that. Put it right up here. Now, if you're going to take this trade, we said it's a scalpy day. We knew that ahead of time before the market even opened. We knew that. So how far are we going to look to take targets? There was questions that came in. Where do I put my stops and my targets when I take these trades? So in the case of this morning on ES, where would you put your target? Your targets. Where would they go? You're getting long from 93 and 3 quarter. What is the minimum you want to get? Where, where do you at least want to get to? You can say a number or you can call something out. Where do you want to get to, at least on that first contract? What do you think? Once you get filled long here at 93.50 or 93 and three quarter, once you're long, where do you want to get to, to get out of one, at least one contract on what we call the scalp trade? I see some numbers coming in. I see four ticks from Bill. Okay, good. Line six from Tafone. Good. Six to eight ticks from Davin. Excellent. Try to get up to the top from Chuck H. Ten tick. Joel wants a ten tick scalp. Kumaresh says eight to ten. So the sweet spot seems to be somewhere between four and six on the downside and eight to ten or twelve on the upside. So let's measure how far it is from here. All the way up to the top. If you hit the exact top, you would go from 93 and three quarter to 99 and a quarter. So what is that? Uh, six and a half. Six and a half times four is 20, 22. Obviously, you're not going to get that. There's going to be some slippage, and you might not make it to here. So yeah, you're looking. You, you know, you you with ES in a tight range like this. You take what would normally be maybe a 10-tick scalp or 12-tick scalp and 
ratchet way down to four or six. I don't know if you're even going to get eight. So let's play out the scalp. Okay, pops all the way to 98 from 93 and three quarter. Uh, ten, eight ticks would be uh, 95 and three quarters. So your scalp would have hit right here. And then if you had a second one and you trailed it up, it would have taken you out just under line six. So you got a quick little scalp and you didn't get a runner. All right, that's you got to be quick and stealthy in here like this. So, so far you've had two trades. And you could have done the same thing here on this box. If, you, if, you, if you're not nimble of foot, especially early in the morning when the market's moving very quickly and you can't draw a box, you can either hit market order. You can hit market order to get in when you see a bounce, like right here or here. Or you can put a limit. In this case over here, you would have put the limit order in to buy when it broke up through here. 99 and a quarter. Now in the case of this scalp, you know you can see that the difference between 95 and 95 and a quarter is, or 99 and a quarter is four times two, uh, four times, uh, what is that, four? No, yeah, four, 16 ticks, but you're not going to get 16. There's going to be slippage, and you're going to miss the top, so you should you dial that back to like 12 or 10. What I'm saying specifically is you're getting long here, and you're putting your sell order to get out right here if you're doing it manually like that. Don't go up right here. You know, you know not to go above it, right? And you don't want to go right on it. The wick of the candle might not have filled it, and then you go right back in your face. Just be happy to get that. What is that, like eight ticks? Yeah, eight ticks. Yeah, and this one turned out to be maybe ten. Cool. All right, and let's round this out, and then i gotta, I got to wrap on this instrument. So where did it come back to when it came back that last time? Same darn place. See it? Same darn place. You would have done exactly the same thing. Uh, OT region box, limit order, market buy down in here. In this case, your stop would now be here, your initial stop right here. Two or three ticks under the bottom of that box. And did you get a scalp? Mm, I don't know if you did. If you dragged it down and let it fill, maybe. That would have been like six, four or six ticks. Extremely tight and choppy. How many pop quiz, quick question for the team. How many of you like to scalp in ranges like this and how many of you don't? Show of hands. Yes, why I like to scalp in ranges, and no, I don't like ranges at all. I avoid them like the plague. Show of hands. I'm trying to get a try to get a reading on the team tonight. Why, yes, I love ranges. Yum yum yum. Give me all you can. I'll scalp all day long. And no, I hate ranges. They're the plague of the earth, and I despise them. <laughs> oh my goodness. I don't. Huh. Oh my goodness, I only see one yes. Where's the yes? Bill. Hey, Bill. Bill says he'll trade them. No, I hate them. <laughs> oh, gee, many Christmas. Kumaresh like ranges. Okay, Kumaresh, you like ranges. Cool. Don't like them. I hate ranges. They're like, I can't say that, Adam. I can't, it's, it's a mixed group. I can't say that. Uh, Joel, you need help setting up Object Trader. D do me a favor. Can you ping um, uh, uh, Gary in the live room tomorrow? And when the uh, live room wraps up, he can go in using uh, Team Viewer and help you get that all set up and show you how to use it. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow after the room. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do this. I've gotten through a few of the questions. What's the next instrument? Let's get pop a couple more instruments. How many of you trade crude? Anybody want to see crude chart? Any CL traders in here? Show of hands. Crude oil, CL with Gary. Gary's a master crude trader, I'll tell you, isn't he? That guy's he, he eats, breathes, and sleeps crude oil. He's very good at it. Let's get a crudy chart up here. Stand by. Yes. Okay, a lot of crude traders in here. All right. All right. Let's get that up and talk about it. All right. I'm paused while it's loading for all you crude traders. Well, Kumaresh, your, your initial stops, generally speaking, on most instruments are going to be in the 8 to 10 to 12, the sweet spot being around 10 to 12 ticks below your entry. But I think I showed you on ES 
there are times when 12 ticks is just too far away and you don't want to give that up on a, on a case of a pullback. So what you want to do is you go down the 12 ticks, you can physically place the trade there or even have OT do it for you. However, if there is a swing that's four or six ticks higher that's established, you want to take your, your uh, uh, initial stop within two ticks of that swing. You drag it up like I showed in those two trades. You drag it up, right? I'll show that on crew. Yeah, I'll show. We'll do a couple of those on crew. All right. Without even looking at a chart, you crew traders, you say you're crew traders, okay? What direction has crude been going for like the past week, up or down? Just remember, I'm not even going to show you a chart. What direction has crude been going for the past couple of weeks? U for up, D for down, up or down. I'll show you a chart in just a second, so you'll have confirmation for your chosen direction. But if you trade it every day, you should know it, off top, like right off the top of your head. All right, good. Well, almost all of you got that. Crude has been going up. All right, bonus points. Bonus points for you super, super duper tr crude traders. Why? Why has crude been going up? why triple bonus points if you know why there is a reason i'm not making this up i'm not making this up i am going to give you a reason and we'll see if anybody knows it you want some help what just went public what just went public Good, Saudi Aramco, the largest public offering in the history of the world. Most of you should know that, right? The largest IPO in the world went public like a week ago, week and a half ago. Saudi Aramco at a market cap of $2 trillion, $2 trillion with a T. That's not a B, that's two Ts. That would like being, that would like having two apples. Or an Apple and a Google combined. Or an Apple and a Google and a Facebook combined. They say, and I think I've read somewhere, that the Saudis are sitting on somewhere between 6 and 8. It's, they don't know the exact number. But it's between 6 and 8 or 10 trillion barrels of, gold, of uh, oil. So obviously OPEC, in order to pump that IPO price up, and get it at a, the highest possible valuation, they need to keep that crude oil above 60. So they're going to cut production, and that means that oil is going to go up. And that's exactly what it's been doing. Look at this chart. Let's go back a few days. Up, 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 up. I mean, you should wake up every morning, and when you see, well, here's a little bit of a down, here's a little bit of a retracement. If you wake up and you see oil up every day, don't be surprised. Same with the equity markets. Like every morning I wake up and it's up. I'm just like, okay. Reminds me of the 90s. 90s were just like that all the way up into the early 2000s. Here's a little pullback. Here's a sell-off here. All right. So let's talk about 6 a.m. Pacific today on Crudy. And um, I wasn't in there, but I am going to try to reconstruct what Gary probably did at the 6 a.m. pit open on Crude. So let's blow up the chart, and let's get organized here. 6 a.m. was right here, which is the crude pit open. So Gary would have opened the room about five minutes or so, five or ten minutes before this. Uh, let's, in fact, let's go ahead and get the room open on here. Um, let's see, 555 would be right about somewhere right in here. Plus or minus a minute. So let me ask you a question. When you look at crude and you fire up your chart before, let's say at 5.30, 5.45, and you're getting ready to go into the live room with Gary to trade oil, what are you thinking when you look at this pre-market chart? 
uh, do, you're going to do the similar exercises that we did on the equities, similar exercises that we did on the equities. What are you thinking when you look at this market and it looks like this? It looks like this right here in the pre-market. What, what do you think about volatility and trend when you look at this overnight? This was overnight. This is all the way back here overnight right here. All the way here's midnight Pacific right here. So here's the Asian session here. Here's the European session here. What are we thinking in terms of volatility and trend? What are we thinking in the pre-market as we observe what oil is doing? So I have to do two things, and I want you to start. You don't have to write it down. Okay, I like to write it down. I have a piece of paper in front of me. I always make notes in the pre-market. I fire up Bloomberg. I see what the 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 uh, futures markets are doing, how volatile they are. I look at the chart. I see if we're in a range or it's trending. You get you got to get prepared before you just don't step into the morning and say, hey, what the heck am I going to do today? I'm just glad to be here. So the first thing we type in on our pre-market assessment is trend. We would say what? I have to fill in a blank here in our pre-market assessment. Well, it can be up, down, or sideways. There's only three ways the thing it can be doing over here. We're talking, we're speaking to the market in this area right here as we're getting ready to trade right here. All right, we got to fill in the blank. Everybody's telling me up. Okay, good. Trend is up. How about volatility? low or starting starting to show some, some good volatility volatility equals range bound breaking out good volatility is it still in the range like es was has it come out of the range from the european session and it's going somewhere over here let me get my cursor over here, we're talking about, I'm circling it with my cursor. It's breaking up and you're getting good volatility. Good. Good call, everybody. Yes. Yes, exactly. Volatility is good. Trend is up. Excellent. You can do this tomorrow. You don't have to do it. I, I find it helpful. I'm, I feel like I'm prepared for what's going to happen next. So when you have this condition in the pre-market on crude, what types of trades are we looking for and how might we take them? Okay, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put trades in here on crude. And I would say what? What would fill that blank in? Given the current condition of trend up and volatility good. We're looking to get what? Short, long, range bound mid-band scalp. What would fill in this blank? in our t anticipation to to trade crude on this morning okay looking for a retracement rob trying to get along around if you get close to the mid band good long okay so the answer is long we're looking for long entries yes good so if you do this assessment tomorrow on your chosen instrument and it could be ym it could be nasdaq it could be gold it could be crude tomorrow morning. Every morning, this is the. I have a routine. I have just this. I've had this routine for years. I get up and this is what I do. I look and I try to start making some early decisions about what I'm going to do. And so there's the game plan right there. As long as as long as this this pre market condition remains intact through the early parts of the trading session, we have our plan right here. Would you agree? Isn't that the plan? Good. Cool. All right. So um, let me advance the chart. Reconstructing real time on crude into Gary opening the route, uh, live uh, trading room and the pit uh, open of the crude trading pits. And when you see, I'll help you out. Everybody in here has said, agreed that the trend is up, volatility is good, and we're looking for long trades. So when you see a long trade set up, you type in the letter L. Are you ready? Okay. All right. Here we go. 
I'm going to help you out. I'm going to blow up this chart for the uh, make the bars a lot bigger. Here we go. Coming out of the pre-market session, Gary's getting ready to open the live room, and you're looking for long trades. Just type in L when you see one, an entry. Okay, here we go. All right, room's open. You're in there. You're watching your chart on your desktop. You're hearing Gary talk about the markets. Before I say anything, the good news is I don't see anybody typing in an L while we're up here. What did we say about ES? What did we say about those markets? When you open at the high of the day, you have to sit on your hands. So I shouldn't see any L's coming in up here. Okay? No L's up here. Right? I don't see any. No L's. You never buy the high of the day. Okay, that's just the simplest way I can say it. I can't say it any more simpler than that. If Especially at the open. Do not buy the high of the day. Ever. Okay, continuing with our exercise. Here we go. Okay, now we're at, uh, let me get the, get the time down here a little bit better. Okay, here's now 6 o'clock. The crude pit is open. Wait a minute, let me stop. Is this a long trade yet, anybody? Anybody? Is this a minimum criteria? Is this even a minimum criteria trade, yes or no? Is this a minimum criteria trade entry, yes or no? Three seconds. No. No. A few of you, and I'm not scolding you, so you got to learn. Everybody's got to learn, okay? We all learn, okay? This is not a trade entry. It hasn't retraced deep enough. So there's been a small handful of you typed in longs. I just, I'm trying to help you by, by illustrating that this is not a long entry. It has not retraced sufficiently enough to give you enough meat on the bone to get to here and even break it. It's got to go deeper, all right? Okay, let's continue on. Let's reset the clock. Here we go. 6 a.m., looking for long trades. Okay. All right. Here's 6.02. Yeah, 6.02. Yeah, let's see. Was that? Yeah, okay, that was 6.01. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> it tickled my throat. <laughs> Let me take a sip of tea. Hold up. Whoa. All right. Get the bars real big so you can see them real good. Okay, here's 602. 603. Yeah, was that 603? Yeah, 602, 603. And there's 604. 605. 606. 607, 610. All right, I'm going to stop right there. Most of you in the room tonight called out a long trade when the bars with these bars formed right here. And you were absolutely correct. That is the long entry. Now, that being said, is that a mid-band trade? Yes or no? The box I have on the chart right there, is that a mid-band trade? Yes or no? Per our definition, per the definition of a mid-band trade, is that, a, is that one? Is that a mid-band trade? Three seconds on the clock. Yes. Good. Well, if you recall, the definition of a mid-band trade is a, a, a market action that gets into the, the uh, band directly above the mid-band, directly below the mid-band, and or on the mid-band itself, like such. Have these two bars encroached into the band above the mid-band right here? Yes. That is a mid-band trade. Is it a long entry? Yes, absolutely. A very good one. And I would bet money that Gary called that out and took it. I wasn't there at 6 a.m., but I'm, I'm betting money he did. Anybody can, can anybody confirm that that was in the room with Gary at that time? Yes, you you saw it and you took it too. He did. 
uh, PB, David, and uh, M, and Steven? Yes? He called it, he took it, and you took it? Good. All right, well, let's see what this trade turned into. Um, because as I recall, I got in late on this, but uh, I caught sort of the tail end of it. But uh, so, uh, all right, so that was the entry right there. We all see it. And for those of you who asked the question earlier, if I didn't use a, 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 um, a region box with object trader tool, could I simply put a buy order in right here? Oops. A buy limit order in here. And the answer, of course, is yes. You'd be filled somewhere around 632, depending on how much slippage you got. Now, if you went 12 ticks below that for uh, an initial stop, so you're filled on that bar right there, filled long on that bar right there. 12 ticks below 60.32 would put your initial stop, if OT placed it or you did it, 12 ticks, down here. Would you want to leave your stop down there? Kumaresh, are you still here? You were the one asking about this. So if you programmed in OT to do 12 tick initial stop, it would put it right there at 20. You were filled at 32. Right? How many of you would just leave it sitting down there? Down here at 20. How many of you, if you took it at 32, would just leave it sitting down here? Way down here. No, no, <laughs> heck no. No, what do we teach you? No, you come up within two ticks of the swing. You cut your wrist down almost in half. You come a tick under that swing at 25 in case it flips on you. And now your risk is only seven ticks, not 12. Does everybody see how and why we do that? Okay, so 12 ticks is here. Our entry is at 32, whether it's a limit order or a box. And we, we don't want it to be way down here. We want it a tick or two underneath the swing here. Say at 25, now your risk is only seven ticks. If for some reason these Saudi Aramco blows up and they, you know, the thing rips and tanks, you get stopped out with a loss of only seven ticks. Now, if you put a two lot on here, and we this is the, how we uh, sort of teach a standard trade entry would have at least a two lot on, what do we do with the targets? How do we manage targets? When a two lot is taken here well first of all we know that you would have to put a two stop here so it'd be two contract entry long and a two contracts initial stop right here right peel off at 10 ticks yes you could take your first target at 10 which would be 42 you could manually put it here or ot would do it for you either way That bar takes it out right there. Now you have one. Now if you did object trader, OCO would take that down to a one lot. So you would go from two to one. You start off with two, and then you go to one. So you got a one lot left. One lot stop. Okay. Now if you have, if you've gone down to one. And you take off your scalp target right here. Should you just leave your your uh, your one lot stop? So what we're saying is your scalp is right there. He takes one off right there, right? One contract comes off here. That's your scalp target. Ten ticks. You're already up a hundred bucks, right there. Yes. Everybody following along? It started as two, and now it's only one. Now, as the market ascends in your favor, takes out this this uh, scalp target here and continues to move up, do you just go ahead and leave the one lot stop down here? Do you leave it down there? Does it just sit, just leave it sitting here? Or do you do something with it? Where should I go? I'm lost in no man's land. What are you going to do with me? Where do I go? Where do I go? Seriously, that's a question. What are you going to do? You got one lift. You got one lot left on your initial stop. What do you do with it? You just let it sit there. Well, let me ask you a different way. What's the first thing you do with it? 
or have object trader what's the first thing you would have object trader do with it it should do something it's not just going to sit there right i mean you know there's no reason to just have it sit the market's drawing off to the moon yeah the initial the first thing you do is you take it within two or three ticks of your initial entry right up here as this is being taken out you drag it up here two or three ticks here in case the market flips and now you have a free trade you would make money no matter what happens here now the reason you don't go on it the entry and the reason you don't go above it is there's lots of times when um when the market will bip up get your get your scalp off and then come right back check your entry how many times have you seen that like a million times right bips right up pulls back right back about where you got in if it's too tight you stop out and then off to the moon you go good okay now you got the runner now if you got a good running day on oil i would suggest that you take your targets out of the way so if you had object trader or you put a, st a target 40 ticks out and you're running like oil on a big day you want to just take that out of the way the way you get to maximize the run is to use the trail stop now let's talk about the trail stop on this crude entry any ideas on how you would trail let me show you some more chart okay it's going up thrust and retracement thrust and retracement going up going up going up how would you trail it what do you use to trail What's a good trail, uh, uh, a good way to trail a market moving in your favor? Hmm? Any ideas? So what I'm saying is that here's the initial stop. It came from here to two ticks behind our entry, which I believe is right in here. And then now it's got to do something. It's got to start the fall, trail stop. Most of you know, of course, is you're following the market up, following the market up, following up. How are you going to do it? You do it at the mid band, you leave it way down here like that, like this. Just follow that mid band up like that. Good. Good. Use a combination of stealth and line six. Turn on the sniper. Good, good, good. Excellent. Yeah. So, what I'm saying is that when you hear, uh, it's, some of you have asked about whether we call targets and stops. We absolutely do. Gary, of course, you've seen a million times puts, he's the line king. He puts lines all over the charts that show swing levels from from the morning or the days back or es i might call out the high of the day and of course that would be a target now i want to show you something a little trick you know this is a weird thing about trail stops they're part art part science and what i mean by that is there's sometimes when you want them to be a little bit loose and sometimes when you want them to be tight let's explain the loose first can you see how there's times when the price will come back through the stealth line the sneaky snake kind of green looking line right here see how it just kind of wicks it and then it bounces and you get another another swing up like that see it so you can clearly see that putting a trail stop directly on stealth is usually not a good idea because many many times it'll just wick it and then boom off it goes and you leave 20 30 ticks on the table not a good thing okay as far as the trail goes now how about how about putting this the 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 trail stop right on line six is that a good idea what do you think right on line six so so you would start here and then you come up to here and then you follow up and then you go and up you go and having it right just real tight right on line six is that a good idea well let's let's uh let's do let's do it okay so here we go we're going up going up going up going up we're right on it sitting right uh-oh what happened there uh-oh that's not good what happened right there took us out so they've been saying maybe a couple three couple ticks below it good okay let's go let's do it again let's do it again here we go all right on six uh, oh no ouchie now if you go a little bit below it knowing that it's going to wick that on a powerful trend up or down it aligned two in the case of downtrend right you just go a little bit loose like that loosey goosey loosey goosey so so it's it's between lines it's between stealth and line six in the mid band but hugging a little tighter to six 
Yeah, because a lot of times it will just wick you out, and then look how much further it goes. You lift all that on the table. You don't want to do that. Now, let me ask you a question in terms of tight and loose, and then we're going to get ready to wrap up. If you've run from your entry at 32, and the market is all the way up here at 95, almost at 61, you've run 60, 63 ticks from here to here. Do you think that you want, want to keep your uh, stops loose, or is it time to start tightening those puppies up when you get way up here like this? Is that a good time to just keep it real loose? 63 ticks? Just leave it way down here somewhere? Just give all that back off the top? Or might it be a prudent thing to start cranking that puppy up real tight like that? Yeah. Yes, the answer is tight, obviously. So a good rule of thumb on most instruments, now ES is the exception. ES, I would say, if you get above 10, 15, 20 ticks, that is your runner and you want to get tight. Most instruments like NASDAQ or Russell or crude or even gold, if you get over about 30 or 40 ticks and you're up at least 50 or 60 and it's still it's running and topping out, especially a, a big swing like an even number like 61, you want to crank that puppy down real good and tight. Because if you don't, you're going to give like a quarter of your trade back in the retracement right here. See it? You don't want to do that. Just capture all that profit up, lock it all down in there, right? That's pretty good. 60 ticks on a 10 uh, is six bones a contract. So look at it this way. You made 100 bucks, you know, one bone on your scalp and six bones on your runner. That's a 700, that's a $700 trade right there on a two, two lot right there. You know, crude most mornings is pretty, uh, especially when it's trending like this, crude, crude ES is good, gold is good. Um, there's some good YM trades that set up. The key is to pick one or two of those instruments and get those on your screens and then just learn those instruments like the back of your hand. So you just every morning you see and trade them sim, trade sim, trade sim. My rule of thumb to help you out is that when you're learning an instrument, whichever one you choose, you want to be, have at least three consecutive days before you even think about going live. Now you can go live on micros. Micros are only like on ES, they're only a dollar and a quarter a tick. It's one-tenth. On, uh, uh, on uh, YM, the mini YM, it's like 50 cents. So they're a great transition. You get profitable in SIM, you pull the trigger on a micro. You don't make a ton of money, but that's not the point. You're transitioning psychologically, you're transitioning between SIM and live trading, and a micros are a great way to do it. So what I'm saying down here, for instance, if you got long in this crude trade, you know, if this was a micro on ES, as an example, uh, or a micro mini on any of the, uh, they have micro gold, $1 a tick, you put two on. And you do exactly like we said. Ten ticks, you pull it off, and then you trail, and you learn. Trail, and you learn. And then you put two micros, and then you go to five. And then once you get to ten micros, you're at a full contract. Yeah, the mini, I think it's a micro CL. Um, I believe it's called QM. I don't know about that, David. I don't know what the liquidity looks on like that. I haven't looked at that in a long time. You're going to have to pull a chart up and see what the what the slippage on that might be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jerry asking here, um, if I trade three lots on crude, I take two off of 10 ticks. Have you ever run the math? Would it be better to run along and take one in versus the two? That's a good question. Um, well, it, it, I, it, let me explain it this way. We've had several different traders in our room ha have taken the two approaches. Okay. Um, I personally, if you're going to, I've never traded like a three. I normally do it in pairs. So if I don't do two, I normally go to four. So in that sense, I would pull the two and then I'd run the two. Uh, in this case here, I would clearly say that you would want to double up on the runners. I mean, look at it this way. You made 10 ticks here. So if you put one lot here, let's do the math real quick to answer his question. So what we're talking about is this. I, I think I know the answer. I mean, the answer is pretty obvious. So we're saying um, 
So in this scenario here, we're saying CO, uh, in the example of this trade, is long a three lot, three contracts, right? In scenario one, Scenario number one is one lot scalp, which equals a hundred dollars. One times ten times ten, right? Ten ticks, ten times so. So that's a hundred. You made one bone on the scalpy, plus what do we say? Sixty ticks on the runner. <clears throat> Excuse me. Two lot runner. times 60 is 120, which equals $1,200. So the total is 1300 So there's your answer. Yeah, so the total is 1300 So you don't even have to do the math. You can see that if you did a two scalp is only 200 plus 600 is only 800 so clearly running the two lot is the better way to go. And that can be over the series of one trade, two trades a week or a month, Jerry. Even if you got stopped on a two lot runner, it's still better than capping your – whenever you cap a, a um, trade of 10 ticks, you're choking off the runner by definition. Right? You're choking off the runner by definition. So even even if you got – even if, let's say hypothetically that you had a tight stop that stopped out here uh, on the two lot, you know, you had it on line six and it took you out on a two lot, was that still better than taking two here and having one? Yes, of course. Right? You can see, everybody sees that, right? You can see here was 10 and here is probably 20. So you had a two lot on a 20 and one lot on here versus two lot on a 20 and one on a one on a, a 20. It will always be better. Two on the runner will always be better. Does that make sense? So there's your answer, Jerry. Two is always better. Yes. Especially if you're doing the uh the uh the, the two lot stop, right? So we had the initial with the two here, and then we take it up here to, to within two ticks or one or two ticks of our entry. So even if the two lots stopped out, you still made money on the 10 with the one, right? You, know, you, you see what I'm saying? On the, on the, where you take the, where you take it from here on the, well, in this case, it'd be three. You take it from three to two and the three to, and the two would come up here. You following that? Two runners are always better than one. The only exception to that is uh, we had a, a trader. Most of you still probably still remember her. Uh, what was her name? Um, remember, what was the old, anybody remember the crude oil trader from five years ago? Traded with us like eight years for a long time. She was a scalper. She would have ten fixed. She had a fixed ten tick target every trade and a ten tick stop, and it, it got one or the other. But her win rate was huge. It was like ninety plus percent. Kitty? Yeah, Kitty. That's right, David. You remember? No, it wasn't Carmen. It was Kitty. Yeah, Kitty. Remember? She used to come in every morning, year after year after year. We trade. We should come in, and she would just take these scalp, 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 scalp. And she, what would she put on a five? She would put on like a five or a ten lot on every trade, five or ten lot. And her goal was five grand every morning. And when she got five grand, she stopped. And she had a tight stop loss too. I think if she drew down like a thousand in the morning, she stopped. So she always had a high win ratio. A high, a high uh, a pro, a profit to loss ratio. That's five to one, right? I'm not suggesting you do that. She just did scalps, scalp, 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 all morning long. Yeah. So if you have a if you have a five thousand dollar profit goal of five k that you stop at. And you have a loss, stop loss of a thousand. And your win loss ratio is 90%. Winners to lo losers. Will you make money? 
What do you think? Oops. Yeah, your win-loss ratio is, is 90%. You know, let's say it wasn't even that. Let's say it was 75 or 80%. 75%. Would you still make money? Yeah, of course. Of course, you make lots of bones. Yes. Absolutely. Because because your your goal is five times that of the loss. Okay. For you mathematicians out there who are good at this whole sort of win loss stop loss ratio, what would be with this scenario a break even scenario? What would your win loss ratio have to be to break even? She got a high win rate, Randy, because she just she had certain setups that she took and she only took those setups. She had one setup. I can't remember if it was the mid band. I think it was the mid band. I, I this is many many years ago. I haven't. You know, if you asked me five years ago, I could tell you off the top of my head, but she's been gone a long time. She, they retired. <coughs> her and her money, excuse me, her, excuse me, her and her husband made a lot of money and they retired. Yeah, so they, I don't know, they're off in some island somewhere. For if if you averaged five grand winners and 1,000 lo loser days, what would be your win-loss ratio just to break even? Anybody? I know what it is. What would it be for break even with a five to one uh, goal, profit goal versus loss? Profit versus loss is five to one. What would you? What, how low could your win ratio go just to break even? Given these two right here. Anybody? I see some numbers coming in. Most of you are getting it. Jerry got it. WC got it. Steven's got it. Randy, PB, John got it. 20%. Right, 20%. You could lose 80% of your trades and, and break even. So the only person making money on that is your broker, obviously. Could you make money with a 50% win ratio? Yes. You can be wrong 50% of the time, and if, you're, if your profit was five times your losses, you would still make money. So you should go in and play with your numbers. You should monitor your numbers. You should go in like every day or twice a week or at least once a week, pull up your numbers. Everybody know how to do that on the account performance tab, right? Account performance tab, you pull up uh, your instrument, you pull up the account, you go back a week, two days, whatever you're measuring, right? I've shown that like a million times. Everybody knows how to do that, right? Anybody not know how to do that? Show again. I'm new. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, everybody's got to know your numbers. I don't. I used to bug everybody about that all the time. I think it drove people crazy, so I don't do it anymore because you should know to do it. Right? So you come in here and you pick the dates of how back far you want to go. Maybe you want to go back a week and a half, okay? And you know, and then you want to go, you want to do it on a currency, and then you pull up advanced. In advanced, it'll show your accounts, it'll show the instruments or what have you. Pick out what instrument you want to look at, ES, crude, gold, whatever you're studying, and then you hit generate, boom. And this will show you. It'll show you it'll, uh, your percentage profitable, your win rate, number of profitable trades, total thing, whatever, all thing, whatever. All your numbers will be right here. You can do it every day. Do it uh, twice a week. You got to do it. If you go back over here, so it's on the it's on the account performance tab, okay? When we say you got to know your numbers, this is what we're talking about. What's your average profit on a trade? How much money do you make normally on a trade? What's your win loss ratio? What's your what's your uh, average profit to an average gain trade? Right. I found most people long term, I'm saying over a period of weeks and months and years, who trade you know, fairly consistently, they're profitable, they're in the game long term, will know your numbers. You will know what these are right off the top of your head. You'll say for crude, you know, 78% um, profitable. My win-loss ratio is, you know, three to one. Uh, occasionally days I'll take a little pop, but it's okay because I know long term I'm going to make it back. I've got a great four to one win ratio. My profitability's you know 68 percent. 
If you don't know your numbers, then you don't know your trades. You got to know these. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop.